Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago over in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 32 through 36. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ is here in this passage talking about freedom. And I hope you notice as we were going or reading through that passage just a little while ago that there are some prerequisites to freedom. Back in John chapter 8 and verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. So first of all, this freedom is going to be for those who have placed their faith in Christ alone. He's going to promise freedom a little bit later, but we start with the premise that this is to those who have believed on him. And then there are some conditions to the freedom that are given in the next part of that verse. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. You're not a disciple unless you continue in his word. That means not merely a tasting of it a little bit each morning when you read five minutes out of the Bible with your mind wandering about the things that are going to happen for the rest of the, of the day. To continue means to persevere in my word. And then he says, then you're a disciple. You have to get to the point of discipleship before you get to verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The continuance in the word of Jesus Christ gives you a knowledge of the truth, and then the truth shall make you free. We want to get down to that little phrase, the truth shall make you free, and plug in whatever we think to be truth, and think that that is making us free to do whatever we want to do, instead of making us free to be empowered to do what God says we ought to do, not merely what we want to do. Have you got sin in your life? If you have sin in your life, it is hindering you from the truth. Jesus said so there in verse 34. I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You have a slave master. You have one who is now in control of your life. What is the sin, the little sin that's in your life that you keep trying to cover up? What are the things in your life that you say, well, it really doesn't matter, but to God it does. The things that you keep trying to hide from other people, but other people really do know it's going on, even though you may try to hide it. Did you know you're not continuing in the Word? And did you know that if you're not continuing in the Word, you're not a disciple? And did you know that if you're not a disciple, you won't know the truth? And did you know that if you don't know the truth, it will not make you free, but you are merely a slave of sin who has deceived himself or herself? We live in a nation that has experienced incredible political, social, economic, and educational freedom for two centuries, more than two centuries. But it goes back to those who are willing to pay the price for freedom. Most of us are not willing to pay the price for freedom, which just Jesus just outlined for us in those few brief sentences that I just read to you. You have to be made free by the Son. If the Son, therefore, verse 36, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But the Son has not made you free if you do not continue in his word, if you are not his disciple, if you do not know the truth that can make you free. That's where he starts, that's where he ends in this passage in John chapter 8. In Philadelphia, at what we now call Independence Hall, 55 delegates from 12 states assembled on May 25th in 1787 for the purpose of revising the inadequate Articles of Confederation. However, 
these delegates ended up scrapping the articles and framing a whole new governing document. We call it the United States Constitution. It was approved 230 years ago on September 17, 1787. And so next Sunday actually falls on that anniversary. Next Sunday is Constitution Sunday, and the Lord willing, if they get printed up, I have inserts for you about the Constitution for next week. The results of the work of the Constitutional Congress over that hot summer in Philadelphia provided the framework for the longest lasting, most successful constitutional republic in all of world history. Isaiah chapter 33, 22 provides a parallel to the three branches of government found in the U.S. Constitution. Isaiah 33, 22 says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Now, our founding fathers divided our government based on that verse. But notice the last phrase. He, that is speaking of the Lord, he will save us. We won't save ourselves. The Constitution will not save us, so it is clearly based upon and founded upon biblical principles. But it is the Lord that will save us. Remember, there were 55 men who were directly involved in framing the Constitution at the convention. Every one of them had an Orthodox Christian background. Let me break it down for you. The Episcopalians are Anglicans. There were 31. That's 56.4%. And I might point out that 200 years ago, those were Bible-believing Christians. They're not like the Anglicans or Episcopalians today who don't know the difference between male and female and who have all kinds of liberal communist agenda. They were Bible-believing Christians who believed the 39 articles, which were written back in the days of Thomas Cranmer, which took a very clear stand for the Protestant Reformation. 56%, 31 of them, were Episcopalian or Anglican. Sixteen of them were Presbyterian. And may I remind you that the Presbyterians of that day and age were closer to Bible Presbyterians. They weren't even slightly close to what is modern Presbyterianism in the United States. But 29% were Presbyterian. Eight of them were Congregationalists. That's 14.5%. Two of them, excuse me, three of them were Quakers. That's 5.5%. Two of them were Roman Catholic, 3.6%. Two of them were Methodists, 3.6%. Two of them were Lutherans, 3.6%. And two of them were Dutch Reformed, 3.6%. 6%. In other words, the majority of them traced their roots back to John Calvin. Traced their roots back to the Protestant Reformation. Traced their roots back to the Bible and believed the Bible. When we consider that, it should not surprise us that there is a great deal of Material, not merely in the Declaration of Independence where the Bible and God are mentioned. The Constitution does not mention God or the Bible. But as you examine it, you discover multiple phrases and multiple principles that are taken directly from Scripture. At the outset, George Washington was elected as president of the convention. He was resolved to take no active part in the debate, believing it improper to do so, given that he was president or chairman of the convention. However, George Washington was not quiet about his advocacy for the Christian faith. For example, May 2nd, 1778, he had charged his soldiers at Valley Forge, quote, to distinguish character of the patriot, to the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian, unquote. On May 12, 1779, he told the Delaware chiefs who had presented their children for education that, quote, 
Above all, what they needed to learn was the religion of Jesus Christ. And to learn this would make them greater and happier people than you are, and that Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention." Unquote. Upon resigning his commission as Commander-in-Chief in 1783, he wrote a circular letter to all 13 governors of the states, reminding them that, quote, without a humble intervention of the divine author of our blessed religion, Hebrews 12.2, we can never hope to be a happy nation, unquote. Washington's own adopted daughter, Nellie Custis, declared that Washington, that you might as well question his patriotism as to question his Christianity. As the convention got underway, Governor Morris recalled how Washington urged the delegates to lift up and look up, quote, let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God, unquote. With the nation's hero at the helm, the outcome of the debates could be taken seriously by the delegates and eventually by the citizens of America. The delegates agreed to keep the proceedings secret so that they would not feel compelled to yield to public pressure. To ensure secrecy, they nailed the windows shut, which made for an uncomfortable environment during the long, hot summer. With the meetings underway, it soon became apparent that instead of revising the Articles of Confederation, the real need was for a new form of government, a federal, Constitution. It began to go badly. Much debates and argument were going on. And with the convention going badly and some delegates on the verge of leaving in disgust, the elder statesman Ben Franklin rose to address the remaining delegates on June 28th. He began by talking about the fact that they had studied ancient history from models of government. And of those republics that have gone the way of the boneyard of history for various reasons, and finally on the governments in Europe, but that nothing suitable, they could not find that there was any common ground. Then Franklin made a plea that they petition God for help. And I quote, Mr. President, the small progress we have made after four or five weeks close attendance and continual reasonings with each other our different sentiments on almost every question, several of the last producing as many no's as eyes, is, methinks, a melancholy proof of the imperfection of human understanding. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark, Job 12.25, to find political truth, and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how it has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbling ourselves and applying to the Father of Lights, James 1.17, to illuminate our understanding. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were insensible of when we were sensible of danger, we had daily proved prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who are engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. To that kind providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national felicity. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend, or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. Daniel 4.17, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, Matthew 10.29 and Luke 12.6, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? Daniel 2.21. We have been assured, sir, sir in the sacred writing, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, Psalm 127, 1a. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel, Genesis 11, 1 through 9. We shall be divided by our partial local interests, our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages, Deuteronomy 28, 37, Jeremiah 24, 9. 
And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing governments by human wisdom and leave it to I chance, war, and conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven, Nehemiah 2.4, and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business, and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate in that service. Here was probably the least theologically orthodox of the framers calling for prayer and alluding repeatedly to scripture. After Franklin spoke, Roger Sherman of Connecticut seconded his motion for prayer. Many were deeply moved. New Jersey delegate Jonathan Dayton reported, quote, the doctor sat down and never did I behold a countenance at once so dignified and delighted as was that of Washington at the close of the address. Nor were the members of the convention generally less affected. The words of the venerable Franklin fell upon our ears with a weight and authority even greater that we may suppose an oracle to have been had in the Roman Senate. Unquote. The Lord Jesus Christ was speaking of this you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you do not go back to the word of God and commit yourself to it wholeheartedly, you cannot find the truth. You cannot reason your way to the truth. You cannot build upon the truth that you do not have. The Continental Congress began to understand this. They had prayed for God's help during the war, and now they were trying to build a nation, but they had forgotten in those opening weeks of the Congress to open each day with prayer, imploring God to guide their directions and bless their efforts. These were men whose patriotism was not questioned. But as Washington adopted daughter said, you might as well question his patriotism as to question his Christianity. <laughs> Those two things go hand in hand in a free republic such as we have here in the United States of America. What is important to note is that Dr. Franklin's passionate plea for prayer and a recess for Independence Day seemed to break the impasse. George Washington and a number of delegates followed Randolph's advice, went to the Reformed Calvinist Church in Philadelphia on the 4th, and heard a patriotic speech and a prayer for their deliberations led by Reverend William Rogers. Afterward, there was a change in the atmosphere in the convention and led to a breakthrough in the debates. Delegate Dayton of New Jersey reported that, quote, we assembled again and every unfriendly feeling had been expelled and a spirit of conciliation had been cultivated, unquote. While some difficulties continued to arise before the conclusion of the convention business in September, the delegates apparently never returned to the fruitless bickering that existed prior to June 28th. That call for prayer made a change in the direction of the United States. It brought about a constitution that is what governs our land today when it is followed and obeyed and gives to us the freedom based on the word of God that so much we delight in. We see that based on that passage I read just a moment ago out of the book of Isaiah, that we have our three different branches. The legislative branch would make laws, treaties, and collect taxes, and have the power to override an executive veto with a two-third majority, and if necessary, to impeach the executive or the judiciary. It would include a two-chambered legislature with the House of Representatives, representatives having proportional representation based on a state's population and elected by the people and the Senate containing an equal number of senators from each state and chosen by the respective state legislature. Thus, the large states would benefit from the House. The small states would benefit from the Senate. The executive branch would include a president who would serve as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, nominate judges, and have the power to veto legislation. 
The president would be chosen by an electoral college composed of men chosen by the voters of each state. The candidate with the second highest vote total would become the vice president. If no one received a majority of votes, the House of Representatives would declare the next president. The judicial branch. The judicial branch would be nominated by the president and approved by the Senate. The court would have the power to decide whether a law is constitutional. Supreme Court members were appointed for life, but Congress could vote to impeach and remove them. According to Alexander Hamilton, the third branch was intended to be the weakest. In a footnote of the Federalist Papers number 78, Hamilton contended, quote, the celebrated Montesquieu, speaking of them, that is the three branches of government, says, quote, of the three powers above mentioned, the judiciary is next to nothing. The founders never intended for America to be ruled by a judicial oligarchy, which unfortunately it has come down to today. The three branch government with its system of checks and balances promised to avoid the tyrannical type of government that the colonies had suffered under the monarchy of King George and his puppets in parliament. The articles demanded unanimity and getting the states to agree on anything was nearly an impossible proposition. However, the constitution required two thirds majority of the states to approve it and also to change it. As we look at the constitution and as we look at its development, and I have many more pages on the different ministers who were involved during that time, but we do not have time to look at all of those. We're reminded that we do not have a godless constitution. Many critics of Christianity's influence in the birth and development of America like to point out the fact that the constitution does not mention the words God or the Bible. In fact, one recent work is actually titled The Godless Constitution. While this work is fatally flawed by its biased approach and failure to provide footnotes to substantiate its claims, it begs the question, why does the Constitution not mention God prominently as in the Declaration of Independence? Well, first of all, it was not necessary to mention God numerous times in the Constitution because the Declaration of Independence with its multiple references to God had already laid that foundation. In fact, the Constitution is dated in relation to the Declaration, demonstrating its place in the founding document, document of America. So the Constitution adds to that founding document the rules by which the new nation would be governed. It could be said that the Declaration of Independence is the why of American government and the Constitution is the how. To explain the relationship between the two documents, Abraham Lincoln used Proverbs 25:11, quote, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in frames of silver. Lincoln argues that the Declaration expresses, quote, the principle of liberty to all, the principle that clears the path for all, gives hope to all, and by consequence, enterprise and industry to all. It is a word fitly spoken which has proved an apple of gold to us. The Union and the Constitution are the pictures of silver subsequently framed around it. The picture was made not to conceal or destroy the apple, but to adorn it and preserve it. The picture was made for the apple, not the apple for the picture. So let us act that neither picture nor apple shall ever be blurred or bruised or broken. As we look into the Christian background of the American Constitution and Declaration of Independence, every framer of the Constitution would agree to at least this much, as they all had a Christian background displaying variety of evidence of biblical worldview and most expressed their faith publicly. Not surprisingly, several provisions in the Constitution have parallels in biblical principle. You had to know the truth for the truth to make you free. Remember, that's what we saw the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 8. They clearly knew the truth. Listen to all these different parts of the Constitution that reflect different sections of Scripture. Articles 1, 2, and 3 give us the three branches of government. That comes from Isaiah 33:22. For the Lord is our judge, judicial, Article 3. The Lord is our lawgiver, legislative, that's Article 1. The Lord is our king, that's the executive branch, Article 2. It is he who will save us. We see Article 1, Section 7, Paragraph 2. No business on Sunday compared with Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. We see Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 4. 
which was uniform immigration law compared with Leviticus 19, verse 34. We see Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 8, the tribunals, that is the courts under the Supreme Court, are given to us out of Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 through 20, and Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 through 10. We see Article 2, Section 1, Paragraph 4, the president must be a natural-born citizen, and that parallels Deuteronomy chapter uh, one of one verses seventeen through um, excuse me Deuteronomy chapter seventeen verse fifteen. We see Article three section one paragraph one the courts. That lines up with Deuteronomy sixteen eighteen through twenty and seventeen verses eight through ten. We see Article three section three paragraph one and two witnesses and capital punishment that lines up with Deuteronomy seventeen six. We see Article three section three paragraph one. Provision against the tainter, that is punishing a group without due process. That lines up with Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. We see Article 4, Section 4, Paragraph 1, Representative Government. That lines up with Exodus chapter 18, verse 21. Perhaps the overriding biblical principle that seems to permeate the Constitution is the sinfulness of humankind. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9. Thus, they provided the need for checks and balances among the three different divisions of government. And finally, the document is signed, In the Year of Our Lord, an overt reference to Jesus Christ. Those who say we have a godless constitution are lying through their teeth. So much for the godless constitution. The framers of the constitution created a document that at the very least has several provisions that have parallels exact parallels with biblical principles and those who signed it acknowledged Jesus Christ as our Lord. Consequently, the framers of the U.S. Constitution had no intention of establishing an atheistic or secular state. President George Washington later stated to a group of Baptists, quote, if I could have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution framed by the Convention, where I had the honor to preside, might possibly endanger the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, certainly I would never have placed my signature upon it." Unquote. Not surprisingly, of course, the most important man at the Constitutional Convention was George Washington. It was Washington's sober presence, his noble demeanor, and the fact that everyone knew that he would certainly be the nation's first president that provided the decisive factors in the Constitution's passage. A mere nod from Washington, the revered Washington, in favor of the new government was enough to convince most people. Be assured, wrote James Monroe of Virginia in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, still in France, Washington's, quote, influence carried this government. What do we do now that we have it? Ben Franklin was once asked by an older lady, Doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? Franklin smiled, and he said, we've given you a republic, if you can keep it. He knew that republics are not easy to keep. We've been through bloody battles to keep it, even a devastating civil war where brother fought against brother to keep it. Now we're deeply divided as ever in my lifetime, so how can we keep it? How can we keep this constitutional republic handed to us by the founding fathers and preserved for us by brave souls who have given their very lives? There are four suggestions that I offer to you today. They all tie back to our text for the morning, John chapter eight. Remember, Jesus told the Jews which believed on him, you have to start off first as a believer, if you continue in my word, that does not mean a mere cursory scanning of it each morning, but if you persevere in, grip hold on, cling tight to, follow in every area, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You have to get to the point of discipleship before you understand the concept of freedom. It's then that he says, and after you've reached that, and you shall know the truth, you can't know the truth until you have clung to Jesus Christ's words. It's then that you know the truth. It's then that the truth shall make you free. Certainly that's where we have to start. But what must we do in relation to our nation? Number one, 
We must keep praying for it. Ben Franklin knew the importance of prayer, declaring in the convention, quote, in the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we had daily prayers in room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. I move that henceforth, and I read this to you a moment ago, prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. I would suggest that if they needed prayer then for our nation, we need prayer even more for our nation. And Paul says that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Number two, not only pray for your nation, keep it by preparing to defend it. Keep it by preparing to defend it. Oh, the generation of men who fought in our wars is passing away. It's dying. Those who actually fought in World War II and in the Korean War, in the Vietnam conflict, which was a war, not just a conflict. Those are the men of my generation. We are passing away. And our nation is filled with people who don't even know if they're male or female, with wimps. Keep it by preparing to defend it. Number three. Keep it by participating in the political process. I'm sorry to know that some of you here did not vote in the last election. Dear people, God spared us from something incredibly horrible but that does not give you an excuse not to have voted when that has been given to you as a blessed right by men who believed the Bible and who gave you a constitutional convention that brought forth the constitution under which we live. We need people like Joseph, like Deborah, like Daniel, like Esther, in places of public influence. If you would keep this republic, you must participate. So pray, prepare, participate. And then finally, keep it by passing it on to the next generation. What are you doing to preserve this nation for your children and your grandchildren? We want to let somebody else do it. While we sit back and relax and enjoy the benefits of freedom. Freedom that was founded on truth and truth that was founded on Jesus Christ and on his word. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples, and the truth shall make you free. If you don't have the prerequisites, you are not free. How are you passing it on to the next generation? We have an obligation to teach our children and their children Handing our heritage down to them without loss. Psalm 78, verses 3 and 4. We must pass our spiritual and civil liberties to the next generation of patriots. They, too, need to learn about our constitutional freedoms. In his history of the United States, Noah Webster, and I hope you all know who that is, wrote, quote, The brief exposition of the Constitution of the United States 
will unfold to young persons the principles of Republican government, and it is a sincere desire of the writer that our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican, that is, representative government principles, is the Bible. If you continue in my word, that's the foundation. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Webster wrote, the genuine source of correct representative government principles is the Bible, particularly the New Testament of the Christian religion. Unquote. Dear friends, you live in a country that gives you that freedom to read your Bibles, to study your Bibles, to continue in his word, to be his disciples, to know the truth, and to experience the true freedom that comes only from the application of the truth of Scripture to the world in which you live around you. And that includes the repression of sin, not merely a nod to it, well, those kind of people are that way, but it's okay, it's their constitutional right. No, it is not, because it is not based on the truth. It is the truth that makes you free. And the more of that kind of rot that gets in, the less of truth there is, and the less freedom you experience until they crush it out of you and your children. Passage of the U.S. Constitution was a remarkable achievement. George Washington wrote to the Marquis de Lafayette, on February 7, 1788, from Mount Vernon, quote, It appears to me, then, little short of a miracle, that the delegates from so many different states should unite in forming a system of national government, unquote. Signer of the Declaration, Dr. Benjamin Rush, went even further, writing to Elias Boudinot on July 9, 1788, quote, I do not believe the Constitution was the offspring of inspiration, but... I am satisfied that it is as much the work of a divine providence as any of the miracles recorded in the Old and New Testament." Unquote. Looking back 230 years, seeing the many ways God has prospered and protected this nation, even with our flaws, America is still the most prosperous, most compassionate, most free, and the greatest mission-sending, gospel-sharing nation on the face of the earth. So under God, let us do everything we can to keep it. And all of God's people said, Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for this free nation which you have given to us. And we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear to those Jews which believed on him, if, and that's where it begins, if, if not, different result, but if, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. As a foundation, we have to be there before I can claim the next verse. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Gracious Heavenly Father, cause us to be a people of the book who know your words so well that we know the difference between right and wrong and are not deceived by the subtle arguments of the serpent as he weaves his way through the political process and all the politically correct agenda. Help us to be people of the book who are unashamed of the truth of the word of God, because you, the God of the universe, has declared it. And Father, we thank you for our freedom and pray that you will help us to defend it, because those men who gave it to us based it upon the word of God and upon prayer. Help us, Father, to be faithful in our prayers for those in authority over us that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and in honesty. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.